everybody. Oh my God, I got an expert on my channel today. I got somebody who is, what's that word? Foremost historian, scholar, super smart lady who, who, uh, who likes history in general, uh, but also who likes the subset that I'm gonna call it that of history, black history. And she gonna blow your mind. Oh man, I'm excited that this lady has come on. Let me tell you something else about this lady. She got people. I to get to her, I had to go to her people. And the people said, Hey man, I know they said to her, said, Uncle, we got this request from this guy. Let's vet him. And they vetted me. <laughs> they vetted me. And I'm telling you, I'm winning. Because then when they vet, a lot of times they say, well, I know that person you got on the channel. I like well, that one. I like that one. Because we got over 400 videos now. We're coming up on our second year anniversary. We jamming here Strong Inspirations. And let me say this. I apologize. My name is Anthony Brogdon. I'm so excited. I forgot who I was. <laughs> Ooh, and so do this, my friends. Hit the subscribe button on Strong Inspiration. You see what I'm doing. You vet me if you must. Watch some of the videos if you must. And then hit that subscribe button. It's free. It don't ask no information or nothing. It just let me know you like me because I can feel the vibe from you, my viewers. Um, hit the like button on this video. Man, you can hit the like button before you watch it. Watch this. You ain't got to watch it. You're going to like it. And then hit the notifications bell and tell somebody about Strong Inspiration. Don't keep it to yourself. Let me tell you something, uh, men out there who are, are single. I bet you, if you told a lady who you had an interest in that you watch Strong Inspirations, you got a leg up. <laughs> They're going to say, oh. You a conscious kind of person. Oh, there might be something there. I'm just giving you a hint. Um, do this uh, easily, my friends. Now, you, you see these videos. Did you see the one I put up with the guy out of Hawaii? He's an attorney, but he loves history. He follows it. He goes over to Africa. He goes to Bali and all them places. Uh, investigating and learning the stories. And then he takes video and he's got a YouTube channel also um, uh, of, of, of his findings. And he talks about the early African civilizations. Watch that video. I got another one out of Hawaii. This guy is the president of the NAACP branch in Hawaii. And he talks about the history there. A lot of times we think that there are not a lot of uh, 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 black folk in a white, untrue. Not a big percentage, but those who are there are making a mark. And he names them in that video. I got it out of New Mexico. What happened is when they fled, black folks out of slavery in many respects, or just migrated and got to New Mexico, they gave them land. It's called homestead. Told them they had to fix it up and stuff like that. They might have got a little gray. They tried to do some stuff there. But nonetheless, that's why we have a pretty good population in New Mexico, in the state of New Mexico. I got a lady on the channel who says that her great great grandfather, maybe two of them, three of them, had a lot, a lot of land, got a lot of land in uh, Milledgeville, Georgia. The land is still in their family. We interviewed her. She shows how they have built these million dollar houses on her land, put a lake in the middle of her land that she got handed down her and the family from this great, great grandfather. There's a lot of that going on. And you all know that that could be possible. This is one of those success stories. Watch that video. Did you see, and this is the last one, I know my guest, she's busy and I got to go fast. Did you see the one I did with the guy who is the international president of the Marcus Garvey Association? It's called the Universal Improvement Negro Association. He's the international president. He came on the show. He found time. 
between his travels and running his business to come on strong inspiration because he vetted me and I, I, I went through. So all this is happening here and you can just go down the list. You can move the cursor. You don't want to hear me. Go past me and go right to the subject. But please do that. And uh, a couple more things. If you don't know by now, I'm a filmmaker. See, this is where it all began for me in many respects. I did this documentary on the rise of Black business in America. It's called Business in the Black. There are topics, there are facts, there are instances that I talk about in this that I did not know, and I suspect you might not know either. Some of the names. In particular, I didn't know that there were slaves who owned businesses. I had I was never taught that, and I was a decent student. Unless I just fell asleep in that class that day, <laughs> it went right past me. When I found out, I said, ooh, I'm going to make a movie out of that. So come and get it. It's streaming on Amazon. And that's not the only thing I talked about, but it's that's one of the big ones. And it's streaming on Amazon, right? So get do that. I took that to 40 cities on my own dime. I was like Johnny Appleseed, just throwing out all this knowledge. And that's where it came from out of this documentary. And then some people said, hey, man, you should write a book about it. And there it is. I followed through everybody. And I wrote a book. And I even included more facts, such as all the ways slaves gained their freedom. It wasn't just that they escaped. That was a good way. It was a scary way. But it was a way. And there was a point where it was so prevalent of them escaping that they had to figure out something. And then they come up with some new laws where they allowed people in the North to just say, you a runaway and we're going to take you back. Uh, Fugitive Act, that's it. I put all that in the book. I also put that business component in the book. I named 40 different Black-owned banks and, 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 and newspapers, all the HBCUs, organizations, how we network together, so on and so forth. The book is very thorough. It's so thorough that if you read my book and you don't learn nothing new, and, and I'm talking to the scholars out there, if y'all don't learn nothing new out of my book, you send me a message, I get your money back. <laughs> a book with a money back guarantee. Here it is. Might be the first of its kind. I'm that confident. But when you when I give your money back, I don't ask for the book back. Give it to somebody else. That's the, I, I I got to this is my mission for this information to flow. So do that. Now you can uh, learn about me and, and my new venture, Inspirations by Strong, which is a uh, some uh, art, uh, wood art, little plaques and things like that. I'll be showing them to you soon that I put my sayings on. And uh, they'll be on the website. So uh, the book and everything is on the website, which is businessintheblack.net. Now, you hear me use this term strong a lot. Strong is my favorite word. I just like the word strong. Strong inspirations, inspirations by strong. Uh, you can call me strong when it's dinner time. And uh, strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And that is my introduction to my guest today. She's a strong, good-looking lady. <laughs> you go, it's going to blow your mind. Come on, introduce yourself. Thank you for being on Strong Inspiration. Well, thank you very much, Anthony. It's a, an honor to be here. And, uh, you know, we don't have to look to fantasy or anything made up to get inspiration from strong Black people. We just look into the history and we find them. Yeah. Tell us your name. Tell us your name. My name is Anastasia Kerwood, and um, I am a historian. I'm trained as a historian. I am a professor of history and also the chair of the history department at the University of Kentucky oh, in good. Lexington. Kentucky, yes. the bluegrass state. Yes, I love it. It is like living in a postcard here. It's yeah. gorgeous. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, well, wait, before we get started into the, you know, the topic, I always do this with all my guests. Uh, I, I ask them some questions about themselves so, so people can understand who they are. And, and, and so the first question always is, where, did, where were you born and raised? 
I was born in Boston, Massachusetts, and I was raised in Cambridge, Massachusetts, with a couple years in Washington, D.C., mixed okay. in there. Okay. Uh, where, where, you were born in, in what side of the neighborhood? Was it predominantly, what, your, your ethnicity, or what, how did that go? Can I ask that? No, no. I mean, the hospital I was born in was in Boston because that's where the hospital was. You know, Boston has some good hospitals. Uh, it's next. It's not far from the black neighborhood. Uh, but when I went home from the hospital, I went to Cambridge, Massachusetts. We were on a line at that point. We were on a line between the historically black neighborhood and the white side of town in yes. Cambridge. Yeah, right, right, right. Because Cambridge. Cause that's where the black people lived on, on in what was their neighborhood called? We were near Fresh Pond. It was you call it West Cambridge now, um, and the side of of uh, we were between Concord Avenue and Huron Avenue, and at over by Concord Avenue that was the black neighborhood, yeah. and then Huron Avenue was a white neighborhood. Yeah, and so right. you kind of got a little bit of the both, a little bit of both worlds in some respects. That's right. And my parents are an interracial couple, too, or they oh, were. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, as a result of that, wh what side did you play on the most, Mass? Well, you know, it depends on where in my, in my phase of life I've been. Yeah. So mostly when we went to church, it was, well, we didn't go to church. We went to Quaker meeting. Oh, and really? so, mm hmm that's mostly white people. Yeah. And but in my school, it was pretty well mixed in the city of Cambridge at that point. This was in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, sure. It's sure. changed now. Yeah, sure. Let's, let's um, go back to that. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, well, then um, I went to um, a predominantly white college. But ironically, that's where I discovered black studies. Really? OK, mm -hmm. let, let me jump back just a second. I want to go into that. But. Quaker, are they are black Quakers? Yeah. What What is a Quaker? What does that mean? Is that a religion? Because Quakers also helped, they played a role in, in helping uh, in slavery, didn't they, in terms of helping escape? They were pretty yeah. staunch in that. So what is Quakers, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. In anti-slavery and in sla and also some Quakers were enslavers. But yeah, uh, but, yeah but Quakers, um, uh, the core theology for Quakers is that there is divinity inside every person. And so the idea is that there, and there is no real authority. There aren't really Quaker priests. Well, there are some, I suppose, uh, some smaller subgroups, but uh, the, the idea is that everybody is, is divine. And so we call it the inner light and everybody has that inner light. And so some Quakers earlier than most Americans uh, some Quakers decided, well, if everybody has this this bit of divinity, then we cannot enslave other people. That is wrong. Yeah. And so, yes, uh, Quakers tended to be ahead of the curve in terms of anti-slavery or abolition. That didn't mean that these white Quakers weren't racist. <laughs> they were still racist, but it, but they were uh, they they were earlier adopters of anti-slavery. What, 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 were there, uh, as you know, in your church or otherwise, what, was that an underground railroad stop? Some Quakers did run underground railroad stops. Yes. Okay. Um, who, who's the famous Quaker that was an abolitionist that we might know? Uh, know? Well, um, Lucretia Mott, for example. Uh, um, she was uh, a white lady who was both an abolitionist and uh, a woman's rights activist. And she's out of Boston or where is she from? Uh, she was in upstate New York. Okay. But yeah, I know, you know, there aren't a lot of famous Quakers. I'm, I, I, yeah. I, I'm trying to think of some of the more famous abolitionists who would be known as Quakers. And um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank because a lot of, you know, like Frederick Douglass um, was, was not, a Quaker, but I'm sure knew plenty of them. Oh, really? And, and did they, were they uh, really uh, very helpful to Harriet Tubman? Um, you know, yes. Um, 
there are, really? yeah um okay. because uh it, it was in in it was far more likely to find an abolitionist quaker than in other denominations um so yes having underground railroads um stops and in that area of maryland um and also in pennsylvania pennsylvania was founded by william penn who is maybe the most famous Quaker in America. Okay. Uh, uh, and so um, th there were a lot of Quakers along that that route to Philadelphia yeah. uh, from Maryland that that uh, Harriet Tubman was was running on the Underground Railroad. It, it, were you taught, uh, uh, switching gears, were you taught Black history growing up? Did you hear it? Um, how, how did this hit you in the early years? Was that something that hit a little light and then it, it it flourished when like you said you went to college yeah you know i could because so actually my grandmother my grandmother um was a scholar also she was the first uh one of the first two black women to or only two black women to study at cornell university in the 1930s and then she got a phd from well they called it it was it was radcliffe but it's harvard she got a phd in in the late 1950s so she had she had black history books all in her house and um and and she was um she was a scholar so she studied she did black studies um you know yeah. in the 60s 70s um but you know back in yeah. the day okay and yeah. so yeah and and also um you know my parents were living black history so one of the reasons that i started this this book i don't know if i should give away what i'm talking about today i want you to yeah we we, yeah. And we plug too on the show so if you got a copy of the book let's plug it yeah. well it's not it's not out yet but oh, it's not out yet but you can talk about it as you see yeah. fit. yes and you can pre-order it at uncpress.org Okay. Uh, just search for Shirley Chisholm and you can pre-order it and it'll get mailed to your house uh, sure. soon. Sure. But um, but anyway, the book Shirley Chisholm, it came about because my parents um, knew Shirley Chisholm had met her during her presidential campaign in 1972. Okay. And so uh, so when I was a young girl, I saw a picture of my parents with a, a very well dressed black woman and um and I said who is that and I thought she might be my auntie because my auntie also is a pretty snappy dresser and wore that style in the 70s okay <laughs> so, okay uh, they said no 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 that's not your auntie that is Shirley Chisholm she ran for president and you can too that's right I love it that, that we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go to her, but I want to stay on you just a tad if you don't mind. Growing up in that household, how did that make you feel? Did you you had that two dynamics, and so your father had to be very liberal in his thought process. Yeah, my dad's a black one, and so and my mother my mother is white, and they were both raised by Quaker parents. Oh man, okay, I know. Did you get teased? Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes here and there about my hairstyle, I wore my hair in braids and. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. But, you know, they kept me. So I have to confess, my parents were hippies. So they kept me in kind of hippie type schools. And um, uh, there was a little bit more, uh, you know, free spirits there. I got you. I love it. Um, yeah. and, and, they, and, and and as a result. Your dad said, okay, you're going to know who you are. Oh, yeah, for sure. Do, do you know on your mom's side some of that story, though? Were they liberal or she 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 bucked the system? May I ask that? Her grandfather bucked the system. I, I'm sorry, my grandfather bucked the system. Right. Uh, so he came, her father came from a conservative household. And he would not have liked Black folks in some respects. Exactly. Exactly. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, and uh, also her, her, my mother's grandmother also didn't like black folks. But and you heard this? Yeah, yeah. I don't remember when I found it out, but I found out at some point. Um, I, I, I might have been a little bit older. Yeah, yeah, I found yeah. this out. 
Yeah, it, and and so when she married him, you no, know, your so your grandfather did. How did he buck the system? May I ask that? So he was, he was a conscientious objector. He went to prison in World War II. So instead of he was of fighting age in World War II, and her father, instead of going, uh, he was a Quaker. You know, Quakers are pacifists, nonviolent. The idea is that uh, you know, if everybody's divine, then it's it's uh, extinguishing somebody else's life is not okay, unless in, right. unless it's self defense. Sure, sure. So he, instead of going off to war, he went to prison. And his family was pretty horrified. Uh, but he did it for religious reasons. And uh, and then he, um, you know, he was kind of a, a another a free thinker um, and uh, got involved in liberal politics. He was a housing activist in the city of Rhode Island in the uh, 40s and 50s and 60s. Or in the city of Providence, Rhode Island, I should say. And so that influenced your uh, your mother to be liberal thinking. Yeah. Sure and and so uh, one more on, those, on that note, if you don't mind. When you, when you have that dynamic, you also hear, have to hear white history too, though, don't you? Well, don't we all? We go to school and we got to hear it all. <laughs> so, how, how, how does someone balance that? From the black history perspective, so much of it is has that negative component this is what they did to us but then the other person has to say i know i was a part of not me personally but this is what my people did and is it always an apology or what what happens in those circles do you think no um i was raised to see the idea of america as as uh the, the ideals of america freedom justice as goals, but that had not been achieved yet. And that came from both the white side and the black side. And so I never, growing up, I never had any illusions about, you know, America being great or anything like that. I knew America has always been a work in progress and more, more, more to the point, America's always been a power struggle. Are we actually gonna share power and democracy with everybody? equally or are we going to hoard power for certain people when when you have that attitude and, and again when you were growing up and some of your let's say white friends had a negative attitude towards black people were you were you did you stand up one day and they looked at you like hey we're gonna beat you up for standing up for saying some counter to what we're saying here in the locker room or whatever I don't remember that, but I remember that there, I remember not always being able to be in the popular group, say. Oh, really? Yeah, because, because a lot, you know, the, the, the schools in, in Cambridge, you know, there were the smart kids and popular kids, the black kids weren't always included in that. So, uh, so sometimes there was a more subtle exclusion, but, um, Nobody ever said it to my face. You played with the black kids. You were on that side of the fence, so you could straddle a little bit of both. I played with everybody. Oh, I love it. And and so you go to college, and I know you're getting all A's in grade school and all that, and you go to college. You you how did you gravitate to black history? What what did you think you wanted to do with black history? How does somebody say that's a career path? Well, at that point, I didn't know. At that point, at that point, I thought I wanted to go to vet school because <laughs> okay. I love animals. Okay. Always. So, um, but but then I took some history classes. The thing about taking history courses in college is you realize that everything didn't just happen, uh, you know, because people just sort of drifted naturally into this inevitable way things are. People made choices all along the way. And that study of how people have made choices and what the decisions they've made in history, that hooked me. And the other thing was I took some courses that looked at how power worked. So people are making choices about who has power and who doesn't. 
and if people don't have power, how are they going to deal with it? So, um, so in my early history courses, I started to figure that out, that um, the, the history had sort of this key to why things are the way that they are. And then if you understand how time has, has changed things in the past, you can understand how to make change going forward. I love it. And then they, so I was in the history major, but then I took some Africana studies classes about black culture. And I recognized some things and there were some things that were new to me that I just thought were fantastic, like Africanisms in US culture. What I does never that mean? really, what does that well, mean? It, it, it means bits and pieces of cultures that African-Americans brought with them in the middle passage. And so, you know, we we brought those over and they're still around and they're influencing U.S. culture as a whole. I just thought I thought that was fascinating that, OK, well, the, what makes America re, America is really is black people and the oh, bits really? of culture black people brought over. Mm -hmm. So, OK, when you study history and then decide it's going to be crap, what do you want to get out of it? You want to get what out of it? for your people, for your students, for your life, what have you? Yeah, um, well, I like to set the story straight. I think that if we have as, um, uh, as appropriate or the best story that we can possibly come up with and the fairest story that we can possibly come up with that I think that motivates students to make change. I'm hoping that when people read my books, they're also motivated to make change around them. And, you know, something about Shirley Chisholm, my, in my most recent book, right. uh, you know, we see her as this, as this, um, you know, almost godlike person. Uh, she was like bigger than life, right? Well, something I found out when I've been writing is that she was human. And if this great hero is human, then the humans of right now can look at her life and say, well, maybe I could be a hero too. I love it. Okay, let's talk about Shirley Chisholm. Where was she born, raised? Give her the early days of her life that uh, shaped her to be who she later became. Okay. Okay. And yeah, we already gave away the story that Yeah, yeah, no. Hopefully, we, yeah, ahead, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully um some some listeners might not have heard of Shirley Chisholm, but right. they guessed already that she ran her president. Right. She was a black woman. She was from a family from Barbados. So, she grew up she was born in Brownsville, Brooklyn in 1924. And Brownsville, Brooklyn in 1924 was an enclave of Caribbean people. So the Caribbean, it's not just, you know, palm trees and coconuts. Uh, you know, it's a really important place in terms of the Black diaspora um, that people went uh, across the Middle Passage. And a lot of them, most of them actually wound up in Central South America and the Caribbean. And her family had been enslaved on the island of Barbados. Um, but that was uh, about 100 years before she was born. And when she got born, she was born to Barbadian parents who showed up in the United States uh, in the early 1920s. And uh, they, had, uh, they met in New York City, they got married, and they started having kids. They eventually had four kids. But uh, New York then and now was pretty expensive to live in. And they decided to save money by sending three of the girls, the last, the last kid wasn't born yet when they all went, uh, but they sent three of their three daughters to back to Barbados to live with Shirley Chisholm's mother's mother. So with her maternal grandmother. 
And that's where Shirley Chisholm lived for six years. She lived in Barbados. Um, and she really, she, she said the education there was very different from in the United States. Um, it was still this British colonial education system, which had its problems. Um, but she was taught by black people. All the other students were black kids and uh, it was pretty strict. And, um, and she said she learned a lot. There was a very rigorous curriculum. And so when she came back to the United States, she was ahead. She was way ahead in a lot of uh, a lot of parts of school. She didn't know U.S. history and she got held back because she didn't know U.S. history. But that's because she didn't learn it in Barbados. Yeah, sure. Sure. She, she said, it when, was, how, "How old was she when she came back? What what years? You know, those six years. What grades? Yeah, were uh, she was four when she went, and she was ten when she came back. So I guess she was there for um, first uh, grade, school, first, second, yeah. third, fourth grade. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, does does she cite the shock that it was to come back from?" Sure. What New York is, the big metropolis compared to a little small island and so on and so forth. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She she was shocked. Um, she was very cold. She said she's still afraid her later in life. She said she's still afraid of the cold because, you know, they were living in a cold water flat. That meant there was no heat, no hot water. And they just burned a wood stove. And she said she and her sisters would huddle under the blankets all day when they weren't in school. Uh, cause it was so cold. Um, she said that Brooklyn was changing so much when they went back that she would get lost because different stores would move out of different storefronts. And, uh, so she thought it was, uh, it was, she was pretty disoriented when she got back and it is, was a big is, culture shock. Is there, is there something in her early years that you could say, we could tell you're different and that you might become great because you you did something that, you know, might be a little extraordinary. Well, yeah. Well, so in Barbados and even back when she came back to New York in the Barbadian community, uh, it was expected that children were seen, but not heard. Um, she said she had a big mouth from a young age. She did not follow that. And so um, there's one story that uh, that her sister told me. I interviewed her sister and she said that there was a guest that uh, a woman came to her grandmother's house, sat with her grandmother and her aunt. And they were talking and came to light that that guest's husband was going to preach the next Sunday at the church. And little Shirley popped out. Oh, no, I don't want him to preach. He makes me sleep. <laughs> Oh, really? Okay. There's a little kid. Yeah, <laughs> she yeah, told yeah, that yeah. to the preacher's sure, wife. Sure, sure. <laughs> was, now, was she in student government or something like that? She was later, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 In high school, was she in government, yep. something like that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. An honor roll. She was very, very good in school. Um, what, 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 what did she say New York did to expose her to culture, to leadership? That kind of thing, because New York also, I, I suspect through her years, she saw the degradation of the black people living in tenant housing and all that, and maybe that might have motivated her to to I want to oh, help sure. others. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, she her own family was in 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 this yeah. in this housing that was really terrible. Um, so yeah, she saw she saw that her parents were working class and they. They struggled to make ends meet. And so she, she absolutely saw that. Um, as far as what sort of inspired her, um, you know, she went to, um, she went to college at Brooklyn College and that's where she got into politics. So, you know, she'd seen, grown up seeing these things around her, but she started to understand that politics was something that could help change what was going on around her and some of the the poverty and the and the policies that she thought weren't fair. Yeah. And uh you know the other thing about being in New York at that time is that most of the black political leaders were from the Caribbean. Oh really? Okay. And yeah, and there's been some research about that um cuz you know they all tended to be 
um, well, we might call them anti-racist or they tend tended to be oriented toward black equality. And um, you know, one uh, there some historians think that that's because they came from places where they saw black leadership and they got to the US and saw a lack of black leadership and Jim Crow, you know, she grew up in Jim Crow, New York. And um, and so and they were they said, well, this isn't they were activists. They became activists and then they became came involved in in politics. And so she um as a young woman, just out of out of college, um, she got to know uh, a man named uh, Wesley McDonald Holder, and um, he was uh, um, he was from Guyana, and he uh, was her mentor. He wound up being her mentor, um, but he also had been was a Caribbean immigrant. Let, let me ask you this: this uh, question came to mind when you say Jim Crow New York. A lot of times when we think of Jim Crow, we think of it only as a Southern type thing. Uh, we know New York and, and Northern cities, East Coast cities had racism. I mean, I'm here in Detroit, we had it, but I don't call Jim Crow uh, uh, a form of policy here in Detroit. It, it, what do you mean by that in New York? Uh, or you yeah. just, that, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's it's not a, it wasn't a policy in, in, in New York. Um, you know, we there's de facto and de jure, right? So yeah. there's um, in the South, those laws are on the books. The black people can't do this, black people can't do that. Right. You know, or the ostensibly colorblind things like grandfather clauses and right. things like that. But Jim Crow as a whole system, it didn't rely on the law to enforce it. Um, the law kind of caught up with it. Um, okay. And so, so um, you know, I think of Jim Crow as, yes, yeah, segregation, as disenfranchisement or voter suppression uh, of poverty. I think of it as poverty. And then over overarching those three things that segregation, disenfranchisement, and poverty is violence. That's how it's maintained or was maintained. Okay. And so that existed in this entire great country, the United States of America. It was all were, over. Were, were there something in New York that particularly they did, in being in New York, that was uh, a racist policy that, you know, I know was, you, you can only live in certain areas or yeah. there were jobs yeah. that they really only let Black people have there, that kind of thing? Uh-huh. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. All of the above. Yeah. Yeah. Black people couldn't do certain jobs. Black people couldn't live certain places. Black people couldn't go to certain schools. It's not written in the law like it yeah. was in the South. Yeah. But it was there. And and so what was her uh, what was her first elective position? So her the first election uh, she won was to the New York State Assembly in 1964. And well, that's a state representative position. Exactly. Exactly. She was how old at that age? Oh gosh, uh, 40. Okay, so she Do had math on the fly. <laughs> yeah, so so now she had done other things in life and now she she takes her plunge and she yeah, wins. She, yeah, she was a teacher. She was an early childhood education teacher. Uh, and she ran. Um, she was the principal of a of a, pre, a preschool or kindergarten um, school, and um, and then she was the director of a child care center. So she had a strong background in early childhood education. What what, what was the condition of women uh, in those eight years? Um, were there women politicians? Were there women in leadership roles? I know not like today, but you know what was the the yeah. status? And so did she break through? Where other you know as one of the first women, even in some of those areas. Yeah, she wasn't the very first, um, but she was the first black woman to represent um, Brooklyn. There had been a black woman representing Manhattan um, in the state legislature, but she was the first uh, to represent Brooklyn, and certainly. There were not very many black women in politics. Um, there, there, there are a few. Uh, uh, um, uh, in fact, there's a wonderful book called "Black Woman in Politics in New York City," and it documents those early 
those early black women who uh, really were the pathbreakers. Um, uh, she was kind of the last of the first generation. Okay. And then, of course, she's the first black woman to win a seat in Congress in the U.S. Oh, is Congress. that right? Okay. So mm -hmm. after the state, she her next move was for Congress. Mm-hmm. That's right. Let, let me let me back up just a second. We talked about black women. What was the status of women in general, uh, black or other nationalities? Were white women a little more accepted? Uh, they weren't just you know working in the homes. They were doing things yeah. at that time. There was there were a few white women around there too. Um, you know, in fact, when she won her congressional district uh, to the U.S. Congress, that district had been held by a white woman um, who was. Um, sort of a, a one of the good old boys okay <laughs> even though she was a woman but she played yes. by those rules okay and um you know, so shirley chisholm came up she was part of this insurgent democratic club that was trying to unseat the old party structure and did and uh and and got um they got their district redrawn and then and they took over um what was her a state assembly district and then um uh, and then that whole congressional district. So white women, um, uh, you know, had there there were plenty of restrictions on white women's opportunities as well in terms of occupation. Um, but there were a token number of white women at that at that moment in po political leadership. Well, I, I, I mean, was she tall, short? you know, feisty, you know, sometimes, you know, I hear those, what was her, you know, physical Oh stature? yeah. She was short. She was not, not quite five feet tall. Oh really? She was that short. She was short, but she was indeed very feisty. Big mouth. The little kid, she told the preacher's wife that she didn't like his yeah. <laughs> her husband's yeah. preaching. She kept it. She kept her big mouth. And, um, and she had a way of talking. She was so charismatic. She had a way of talking uh, that people really responded to. And she had a little bit of a lisp and sort of this funny, um, like a, a clipped Caribbean accent that was, that was, she sounded almost American, but yeah. um, sort of a blend. Yeah. And, uh, but she just, she could just get people eating out of the palm of her hand when she talked. Oh, really? Also, she was a really snappy dresser. Yeah, it does look like that in the picture. She's a good looking lady too, as I hear. Yeah. And, and yeah. so I'm not gonna try to give away the whole book per se, but just a couple more questions in this regard. She, um, did she face controversy at any point? That, that, oh, you know, oh. oh yeah, <laughs> uh, for sure. Uh, well, I guess, well, you know, she made enemies on her way up. Uh, so there were some people in Brooklyn who didn't like her. Um, and they said that she'd sold out to the party machine. Um, and so... To the um, Democratic Party machine. Exactly, yeah. Which yeah. they thought wasn't helping the, the, the small common man. Yeah, yeah. Is that what well, it was? And okay. especially Black people. Um, so uh, what was said about her when she was she was up for congress as well you know she she you know worked her way into that position to be nominated and you know but she, we're not sure that she's you know actually 100 percent for us that said especially those detractors tended to be men women um and black women were her strongest supporters through her entire career from new york state assembly to getting elected to congress to her run for president and and her whole her whole congressional career because she stayed in Congress ten years okay. after she ran for president so she was there fourteen years. Is is there something that she did in Congress that is a bill of hers that stands out? Well, she was involved behind the scenes with a lot of bills that we can't imagine living without, like the Higher Education Act, Title Nine. Um, she was behind the. Equal Rights Amendment, of course, that was never uh, ratified. Um, and she was um, uh, behind some labor legislation, education legislation. But um, I would say the most important legislation that she pushed through that never was enacted was the 1971 Comprehensive Child Development Act. 
And what that was, was universal daycare in the United States in 1971. So 50 years ago, both houses of Congress, the House of Representatives and the Senate, they both passed this Comprehensive Child Development Act that included universal daycare. They both passed it, but there's one more stage, of course, that has to happen. The president has to sign it. Who was president in 1971? It was Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon had advisors, especially advisors to his right, who were saying, mm, now this looks too much like socialism or social engineering. It's going to take away people's people's rights to you know, raise their kids the way they want to raise them. And so Nixon did not sign the legislation. Mm. But if you imagine, I, I feel like that was kind of, that 1971 moment was kind of this, uh, you know, people like to talk about inflection points or, you know, tipping points or like it could have gone either way, right? Okay. You know, we could have moved to being a country with universal child care and the freedom that that would create for working people, um, you know, of both, of, of all genders. Yes. Or we could go back and we could keep child care much, much harder to get, much more expensive. Okay. And, you know, have that barrier for people um, who are trying to uh, to to work for a living. And Nixon said, uh, "Yeah, we're going back." Yeah, okay, I got you. Did she authored that bill. Well, yes and no. She wrote a lot of the parts uh, that would have been the universal child care part. Um, some of it was changed, but then um, it was changed in the House um, in the Education and Labor Committee. But then when uh, I don't know if you remember your schoolhouse rock, how a bill becomes a law. But yeah. once, once the Senate and the House pass a version of a bill, then there's this thing called a conference committee that has members from both houses that then go through the legislation and reconcile the two versions because sometimes they get changed. And she was the education and labor representative on that, con on that okay. conference committee. Okay. And so she pushed it through on that committee. And a lot of her work she did was on these committees. She wasn't necessarily on the floor. She did give speeches on the floor. Oh, she was okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She gave plenty. She authored some bills, but um, this bill doesn't have her name as the sponsor on it, but she was the one who got it through the process. I love it. Okay. When, when, were there other Black Congress people at the time she was in office? Why, yes, there were. So you've probably heard of the Congressional Black Caucus. Yes, yes. And it was a big deal. When I was a kid, it was a big deal. It was, you know. Yeah, this, yeah. I, I go to the weekends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They yeah, yeah, started yeah. those weekends when she. Right. So, well, when she got to Congress, there were seven total uh, congressmen and women who were Black. Um, in she started in 1969. So excuse me, she got elected in 1968. She started January 1969, and there were seven of them. And so they started meeting informally. They called themselves the Democratic Select Committee. And it was uh, Perry Mitchell, uh, Gus Hawkins, uh, um, Louis Stokes. Um, oh, I'm going to leave somebody John, out. Probably uh, John Conyers. Don Conyers, exactly. Yep. Yes, of course. Yep. You're, you're from Detroit. Yep. So, right, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that founding generation. So they all, they all got together and started meeting. Then in their in her second term, um, which started in 71, they formally created the Congressional Black Caucus. They were up to about 13 at that point. Okay. And what, they what? they okay. raised money and they made they made it into uh what you know the organization it is today. A uh, couple more. What made her decide I'm going to run for president? Who did she run against? Who was in that? You know, how well did she do? Um, yeah. You know, so yeah. on and so forth. Did she okay. speak on it at the convention? That kind of thing. She did speak at the convention. Yeah. Yeah. So 
Um, until um, until Hillary Clinton in 2008, she was the first woman to get a significant number of delegates at a Democratic National Convention. She made it all the way to the convention. Um, she also, you know, it was a little took a little bit shorter, but Jesse Jackson in 1984 was only the second black person to get a significant number of delegates at a Democratic National Convention. So she got that far, but she, this is uh, kind of hard. It took me a while to kind of figure this out and wrap my mind around it, but she ran, she ran to win. She ran a campaign, a serious campaign that, as if she was running to win, but she didn't expect to win. What she was trying to do was to influence the Democratic Party, the platform, and the eventual nominee by bringing together a coalition. So she's like, well, I'm a woman and I'm a Black person. I have appealed to young people. She was an anti-war candidate. I'm going to bring all these people together. And then she said, and I quote her, we will be a force to be reckoned with. Okay, I love it. So that's what she's trying to do. I, 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 how many votes did she get? Do you, do you know that? Uh, yes. How uh, many did she do? At the convention, she got a like hundred and fifty-one and and a quarter, or something like that. So. Well, I mean, we'll put that in perspective, though. The the guy who won got how many? Oh, like three thousand. Oh, so, oh <laughs> yeah. okay, okay. So okay. it was nowhere near what she would have needed. Yeah. Did nowhere she win near. New York? No. No. What was her best state? Who 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 did she get the most from? Well, the best state was New Jersey, but she ran unopposed in in the, the primary. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Yeah, okay. she did pretty well in North Carolina. Oh, really? Um, yeah, she was on the ballot. Uh, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, um, Florida, Massachusetts, um, uh, New York, California. So oh. California was a big deal because um, it was a winner take all state. But, um, well, it, I don't know how much time we have left for me to explain yeah. all this, but yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a fight over whether it would be a, a winner take all state or a proportional state. And if um, if it had been awarded proportionally in the end, she would have had 12 delegates from there, which was, you know, a nice, a nice yeah, chunk. Sounds like it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. There, there, but, um, oh, <clears throat> go ahead. But well, what happened at the convention when it became clear that so who she was running against uh, the two front runners were George McGovern. Okay, I remember that. Name. Yeah, he he eventually he eventually won the nomination, yeah. and then the other big guy was Hubert Humphrey, okay. who had been yeah. vice president uh, for uh, Lyndon B. Johnson. Right. So when it became clear that McGovern was was going to beat Humphrey. A lot of black delegates from southern states started giving her their votes. So she went to the convention with like 30 votes. And she wound up at the end of the convention, she uh before before the final uh ballot was tallied, she had that 150 and something. Oh, so okay. so um so she actually had a lot of support from black okay. southerners. Yeah, oh really? Okay. What mm -hmm. what what is uh what as we come to close on what was she married? Did she have family? I know you mentioned kids. Did she uh, what did she do for a hobby? That kind yeah, of yeah yeah okay um she was married twice. She was married to one guy um Conrad Chisholm uh for uh her, when she ran for president and he was kind of her bodyguard. He took care of her. Um they couldn't have children. Um but um she had a lot of other children she was like an other mother she had um staffers and people that she taught um and, and people she mentored who were kind of her yeah. who, who you know her legacy um then she got uh, married the love of her life uh in the late 70s she got remarried she got divorced and she got remarried okay. uh, to a man named arthur hardwick and uh and they moved to uh buffalo new york uh, that's where he was from. She met him in the state assembly. So they met before she got divorced, but he was married then 
Yeah. Okay. Another anyway. story there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's another a story, story there. <laughs> yeah, another story there. And and so uh, at the she end of the day, dance. I'm sorry. Oh well, you asked about you asked about her hobbies. She loved to dance. Oh really? She was a good dancer. Mm -hmm. She didn't play an instrument or anything. Uh, she played piano. Oh, she did. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did she have a, a a motto that you know how? Uh, some people have something that they say all the time. Was that something? Oh, yeah. That, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, power concedes nothing without a demand. There you go. I know that one. Yeah, Frederick Douglass. A little Douglas. twist on it. Yeah, I think Frederick mm -hmm. Douglass says it a little differently or something like that. Yeah. Um, what do you want people to get out of your book? What do you, and, and, and writing this? Yeah, I want people to be inspired, frankly. I love it. Yeah, just go back. You know, you you look at this person's life, and no, she wasn't perfect. She was quirky. She, you know, got a little over ambitious here, and she, you know, she had some kind of you know uh, odd odd uh, quirks here there. But but uh, but but she was she lived her ideals, and um, and she turned out to do amazing things. Um, and and she did. She created change. She created a whole generation of of people who she mentored, um, who are some of whom are still active in politics today. Barbara Lee is the most famous. Um, okay. Maxine Waters, yeah. um, uh, um, uh, 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 Donna Brazil. Um, yeah. So, you know, some of these women who she she mentored um, and worked with are still active and and so i want people to be inspired to say i can still be human and i can still do great things you, you, you i got another you said quirky what, what when you make did she smoke or something like that is that a did she, <laughs> did she quirky like that or did she drink or nothing like that well, she didn't really drink much or, or smoke um you know one of her quirks was that she was so confident that sometimes she would say things to people that would really put them off. You know, she'd say, well, I'm the best at blah, blah, blah. Or I'm the best. Oh, really? I can do the best. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Okay, I got you. Yeah. And so I think maybe she could be a little tone deaf about, um, you know, when people could hear that and when they couldn't. Yes. Um. So they get a little, but, you know, the thing was, is she was who she was. And yes, she had great it. belief in herself. When you when you talk about uh, and we've said this a couple of times, being a sharp dresser, did she get known for that? That she always wore dresses, and I know the pictures. I think she had something around a blouse with something around her neck. Was that oh, a yeah. signature of hers? Well, she really liked those knit suits, those oh, knit really? skirt suits. Yep, and uh, nice shoes, nice bags. Um, yeah. <laughs> especially. When she was running for president, she had uh, someone work for her in her office uh, um, in Congress who helped her with outfits. Um, there was a shop in Washington, D.C. called the French Poodle. And she got um, the, her staffer helped her pick out outfits or they would bring over some outfits and she'd pick them out. Um, she also she wore wigs. And so they had a wig shop that would style them for her. Oh. Uh, so everything was always just, you know, perfect, done to perfection. Are there, are there, last question, <laughs> I keep saying that, is there a monument somewhere in her honor, in, in, in her, in Barbados, in, in, in Brooklyn, uh, historical markers, that kind of thing? Um, Brooklyn's putting up, uh, Brooklyn has uh, created Shirley Chisholm Park, and they're also going to put up okay. a monument. Okay, nothing but in Barbados. Not that I know of in That's Barbados, right. and I tell you, this, the U.S. Capitol needs to have something, too. But they oh, yeah, don't have I love it. it. Yeah. I love it. They have a portrait, uh, but that's it. I, I do this always. Is there a question that I have not asked you? Something that uh comes to mind about her that you want to share? Anything like that? Oh Lord. Um you know, uh I I I I think you have you have asked just about everything. I think I've had an yeah, opportunity okay, to, okay, okay. to answer. Um and, um, you know, the one thing you haven't asked is how long it took me to write this book. It took me almost 15 years. Oh, really? <laughs> so it's been a long time. Uh, but uh, so I just want people to know that keep plugging. <laughs> and so you, sometimes things, sometimes a mountain takes a long time to climb, but you just keep putting one foot in the other, in front of the other and you get there. I love it. 
thank you for coming on Strong Inspirations. I really appreciate it. Yeah, uh, the, the tenacity that you show 15 years, was that because you wanted to interview somebody and it took a while to get to them? Uh, they kept saying no, some pictures. I know you had other things to do in life, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was, you know, teaching my classes yeah. and, uh, you know, all that. But um, yeah, you know, it just took a, it took a while to find all the sources I wanted to have. Um, but it just also took a while for me to think through it and to actually write it. Yeah. So I would say all of the above. Yes. Um, it was just a long, a long process. Yeah. And you, you're proud of yourself for doing this too, I know, right? You're going to celebrate when you see the first copy? Oh, you know I am. <laughs> <laughs> About time. Who, who are you going to send copies to? Uh, yeah, complimentary copies. I, I mean, if you may, if I may ask, is there oh, gosh. 10 people that, Okay, you told me I wasn't gonna do it. Here's a copy. You, yeah, you told yeah. me I wasn't gonna do it. Here's a copy. That kind of thing. You ain't gotta <laughs> name people. names, but there are people like that. Yeah, well, you know, actually, there, there, yeah, there's one or two people like that. But yeah. you know, my loved ones will get them. Uh, you know, yeah. my family. Uh, yeah, you know. To the to the to, uh, CBC. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've been trying to send an advanced reader copy to them. Uh, I just need the correct address to send oh, it. Yeah. Send it okay. to them. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, but and yeah. Are you ready to do public speaking on this? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, um, you know, you mentioned the, the people who helped set this interview up and, um, uh, you know, I, I have um, s someone who is helping me arrange a book tour. I'll be yes. in Washington, DC, New York and uh, Boston early next year. And I'll also be virtually in California. Okay, I love it. Do a virtual talk, uh, book yes. talk in California. Yeah. So yeah, so we'll, it'll be firing up next January. Yeah, oh, congratulations. That's that's good stuff. Well, hey everybody, this is what I do with strong inspirations. I tell you, I get the department heads. I get people who they themselves are ordinary, like Shirley Trism, and they themselves do extraordinary things. They themselves are strong and have tenacity and 15 years went by and now there is a day when it will come to fruition. They come on the show and they share this with you. And now I know you know a little bit about her but uh, and about Shirley Chisholm because I, I know the story. I mean, I've heard, her. I just didn't know what happened and who she was and I didn't know she was short, whatever, whatever. And, mm -hmm. and, and now I'm I'm even more enlightened about her life. Thank you for that. And so I say this, everybody, hit the subscribe button on Strong Inspirations. Hit the like button on uh, the this video. Uh, hit the notifications bell. Tell somebody about us. And uh, to you, I say this, and I mean this with all sincerity. I really do. I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind, write some more books. You got more thoughts, I'm sure. And it won't take so long next time. You know how to figure it out easier now. You be it'd be like it, two, three books, oh, yeah. a book every three years or something. That's right. And enlightening them students at the uh, the University of Kentucky. You know what that background is, and mm -hmm. how they didn't allow us there. And then all of a sudden we were beating them in basketball. They said, "Hold on, we got to get them some on the basketball team and the football team." I know that we talk <laughs> about that. Congratulations mm -hmm. for doing it. Uh, Thank you. Does, does, uh, you mentioned her motto, uh, and her motto was again, and that's going to close this out. Power concedes nothing without a demand. There you go. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate you. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.